Welcome everyone. This is Katie Presses, Director of Research and Operations here at Birchworks. Today, Linda Birch, our Managing Director, will be joined by Jonathan Beckhart and Andrea Trevino from datascience.com to delve into the complexities of hiring data scientists for your team, something we know all too much about. Um, a few quick logistics items before we dive in. Uh, only our presenters will be speaking today, so your phones and microphones are muted. Um, but of course, we welcome your questions and we'll have time for a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So I will collect your questions via the chat function on your screen. Um, feel free to submit your questions for our speakers throughout the talk, and I will prepare those for later on. Um, if you experience any technical issues, um, you can also submit those through the chat box as well. Finally, today's session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel within a day or two. So if you missed part of it or would like to share it with a colleague, you are welcome to do that. Now to kick us off with speaker introductions, I will turn things over to you, Linda. Thank you, Katie. Um, first, I'd like to give you a little background on our speakers today. Uh, Jonathan Beckhart is the COO and co-founder at datascience.com. And if you're not familiar with them, datascience.com is a young but very fast-growing enterprise, enterprise platform company that's been uh, making a real name for itself in the data science community. Um, but I'll let Jonathan and Andrea elaborate on that a little bit more uh, in a few moments as we get into the, um, into the presentation. Uh, Jonathan has also led product management and analytics at tuition.io, which is an online student loan management service, um, and also developed big data strategy um, during his time at American Express. Uh, Andrea is a lead data scientist at datascience.com where she leads the cross-functional customer success data science team. So simply put, uh, she works with customers to design solutions for business needs across a range of verticals, uh, as well as also um, doing some other interesting things including uh, producing education, uh, educational content and contributing to internal data science strategic efforts. So her background is in healthcare, speech recognition, and machine learning for understanding human perception. She's received her PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, one of our favorite universities. So uh, of course, um, I'm sure many of you on the call are familiar with my background, but for those of you that are maybe new, uh, I'm Linda Birch, the Founder and Managing Director of Birchworks. Uh, we're an executive recruiting firm that specializes in placing people in the quantitative business, business sciences, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say that I've been doing this for um, over 30 years now. So we are based in Evanston, Illinois, uh, right down the street from Northwestern, um, but we recruit nationwide. Um, we um, uh, our clients are among some of the biggest firms like Procter & Gamble and Apple and Walmart, um, as well as a number of consulting firms, advertising agencies, um, and a number of startups. So Grubhub is a client of ours. Uh, we're also, um, we've recently placed a senior level person um, with Jay Walker's new startup called Upside Travel, which many of you may have heard of by now. So Birchworks is known for its comprehensive uh, Birchworks studies. Um, which are industry reports covering uh, compensation and demographic information for our uh, specialty areas of data science, predictive analytics, and marketing research. Um, and we're widely regarded as an industry leader when it comes to insights on the quantitative hiring market. Um, and, um, and you'll see us in the press uh, pretty frequently. So, um, th well, that's all uh, for me, from me right now. Um, uh, again, thanks for joining in today. You know, we've had a terrific response to this webinar. Uh, we had nearly 150 people signed up when I last checked the number earlier this morning. So I'm very excited to be partnering up with the super talented folks over at datascience.com today. So I'll turn things over to Jonathan and Andrea, and let's get started. Great. Done. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the introduction, Linda. Um, so I'm going to start just by talking a little bit about the motivation for this. So at datascience.com, our goal is to enable data science for every business. And we really want data science efforts to be successful. So I often get asked, you know, 
how do I create a strong data science team? What are the data scientists I want to, I want to be hiring? And as I dig into these questions, you know, the first thing I try to understand is what is it that people are trying to achieve? So oftentimes, you know, I hear from people, well, hey, I know I have all this data and I know that I should be doing something from it. Or I know that, you know, my CTO is saying I need to hire a data science team because if we don't do that, we'll be behind our competition. And so it comes, as you dig further, there's sort of this idea that people come to this magician that can conjure the black arts with data and just make great things happen for a company. And, and too often, we see that being a path to not the real results you can get from data science. And so really with this time today, what Andrew and I want to talk about is how do you set the right expectations for your data science program? How do you find the right person so that when you do and make that investment, to whether it's hiring one data scientist or hiring 10, 20, 30, 40, you'll get real results from your team. Let me step back and just talk a little bit about datascience.com. So as I said, datascience.com, our goal is to enable data science for every business. And core to that is our enterprise data science platform. So our, our enterprise data science platform brings together the infrastructure and tools that data scientists use and allows them to deploy them in a real world environment so the data science efforts are not on the sidelines of an organization, but central to, central to the organization's results. Um, a little bit about the services we've provided. So we've worked with companies from all sizes, uh, whether small startups to large enterprises that span the globe. And no matter, the, no matter the vertical, every company has a need for data science. And our goal is to help make those companies successful. A little bit about, about my background. So in my role at datascience.com, I've overseen a team of over 20 data scientists, interviewed over hundreds, and looked at resumes of over thousands. So it's really given me a good perspective on the patterns that lead to success with data science programs. Um, I would also add, though, that I'm non-technical by background. Well, as Linda mentioned, I, I led analytics at a previous company I worked for. By no means do I have a PhD, do I have a master's degree in statistics. And so for the people in, in the audience that are coming from non-technical backgrounds, I'm hoping that some of my experience in hiring technical people and what a non-technical pe person can bring to that will help um, will help their efforts. As for Andrea, um, Andrea comes from a very strong technical background. I'll, I'll allow her to talk a little bit about that right now, but I think I'm hoping that she can bring um, a lot of an understanding of how to actually get deep into uh, the technical uh, details of assessing a data scientist. Yeah, um, the term data science itself is a relatively new term. It's only been around for, I mean, less than 10 years, really. But there's so many people that have many years of experience beyond that. Um, I really started in electrical engineering. A lot of people work in computer science and then move into data science. Um, but things like machine learning, statistics, a lot of the concepts behind data science work have been around for really decades. Um, so one of the key things that I'll be talking about is just how do you interpret all of those different experiences um, in order to assess data science skill. Great. So uh, as, as I talked about, really data science is a broad category and obviously Right now, it's a trending topic. Um, it's an area where businesses are making a lot of investment. And so when we sit down with companies who are saying, hey, I want to expand my data science program, or I want to take it to the next level, or I just want to start it, the real question we try to get to is, what do you want to achieve with data science? So for any business, there are a number of ways they can use data. But what we like to talk to businesses about is, what is that core business problem that can be solved with data science? And it really depends on the vertical. So for example, if you're an e-commerce recommendation engine and knowing how to point consumers to the right products that are going to drive value for them is the core data science problem. If you're in manufacturing or logistics, you're going to be looking at optimization problems so you can manage supply chains effectively. Knowing what that core problem is is going to allow you to define the parameters of the, the role that you want to hire so that when you bring somebody on, that person both has the experience but is also set up for success. So 
So once that you've really defined that the what kind of problem you want your data scientist to solve, you need to break up those problems into particular skill sets. There's no data scientist that is an absolute expert of every single algorithm out there. So it's really useful to break out what algorithms or techniques you want them to be strongest in. Um, on the left-hand side, I have some very general ones. And on the right-hand side, I have some more specific ones that people are using more and more in the data science field. So to speak to some of the ones on the left-hand side under the general data scientist umbrella, statistics and experimental design, this is really when you have a question that needs answering. Is A better than B? Um, how do I make a particular decision? Did something that I changed in my strategy or in my um, spending actually affect the outcome? Machine learning is one everyone is talking about and everyone has heard of. This is often used for classification of data. It's used for grouping data, um, and it's the most often te used technique for prediction. Data mining is more along the lines of handling data, cleaning data, steps that might also be called data engineering. Um, and this is when you need your data really processed and understood. Um, optimization, John spoke to this very quickly, where it's where you're trying to maximize some outcome um, based on the factors that you can control. So it could be things like supply chain, it could be maximizing some outcome based on how you spend your budget. Um, and then basic coding, just everyone needs this. Um, but the level of coding that you want this person to be, do you want them to be at the level of a software engineer where they're creating algorithms that directly interact with your customers? Or are they just, do they just need coding at the level where they can actually give you the answers that you want? Um, a few of the ones on the right, time series analysis, is usually predictions or forecasting. Um, econometrics is really understanding how behavior occurs. Natural language processing is very, very popular and only growing, and that's where you do prediction or analytics on um, words and text. And image recognition, um, everyone is becoming more and more familiar with this with self-driving cars, with camera phones, um, it's everything that you can do with images. So these are two um, types of data scientists on the data science spectrum. They're really, in my mind, the two endpoints. Um, there's the researcher and there's the engineer. And it's very important to know exactly what you want to hire, and it's always a good idea if you can hire a team to have a mixture of these types of data scientists. Most people tend to fall between. So a researcher has a stronger math background, maybe they have a PhD, or maybe they have some sort of degree in statistics. Um, they're used to developing algorithms. They're used to answering questions that don't have an answer. So that's really great if, if you're starting a new data science team and you don't really know how to make the most value out of the data that you have. Um, they probably code in R or Python, and a data scientist who is a researcher likes to tackle a lot of different problems, really likes um, to find the truth in the data. On the other side, the engineer is probably someone who might have come from a software background. They're a very strong coder. They love living in the code. They're going to work great within your engineering team. They're going to be able to follow the same best practices as the rest of your engineers. They're going to want to work quickly and tackle a lot of low-hanging fruit, but they might not start building custom algorithms for your particular data set. Um, this is also a very valuable type of data scientist because they're going to tackle things quickly and be able to prototype quickly. Um, they probably work in Python, Scala, they might also work in Java. You can even see a little bit of this in C++ or Julia. Um, and they really are kind of the powerhouses in terms of volume and velocity. This is a demonstration of what the data science process can look like. Um, it's a very simplified view. In truth, 
really every step along this process is connected to every other step. But if your team or you work with CRISPM or other frameworks for data science problems, you've seen this kind of flow before. And it's really the flow from ideation of the problem all the way to finalizing the problem and completing it and doing iteration on your particular um, technique and decision. So when you hire a data scientist, they need to, if you have a small team, they need to be familiar and good at this entire process. And if you have a large team, you can handle, you can hire specialists that are good at just particular parts of the process. So depending on the size of your team is how broad your data science needs to be in terms of their expertise and their ability to tackle all of these steps. I would say, based on my experience, the most important steps here to hire for is step one and step five. You want someone who is very good at defining the problem, figuring out what they want to solve for, how they're going to measure the outcome, how they're going to measure if the data science project actually has an ROI. And then in step five, that's the validation, where you see whether your approach really worked. In this, you want to hire someone with a very high degree of skepticism, where they won't take their answers at face value. And they'll look at the answers and reflect and question over and over again. This is something you really want um, in your particular data scientist that you hire. Once that you have an idea of the kind of data scientist that you want to hire, the skills that they need, the problems that they're going to solve, um, you're going to start looking at a lot of resumes. And there's a lot of resumes out there. So you know the problems you want to solve. You can look for a track record of solving similar problems. What you can now look for is public-facing work. Um, this can be a blog. This can be publications if they have an academic background. Or they might have a GitHub repo if they're more of a software type of data scientist. That's where they might store um, the code where they've done their data science work. And what that shows to you is not just a passion for data scientists, but also the ability to communicate their results with the outside world, which is really important because it means they'll be able to communicate them internally within your organization. The fourth point I have here is that you need to be able to recognize um, terms beyond just a list of keywords. Um, I think at this point everyone knows what the, in quotes, kind of data science keywords are, things like deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and then particular techniques like singular value decomposition, classification, regression. Um, hitting those keywords really isn't enough. Uh, it never was and it isn't anymore. Um, you need to also show that you have a broader knowledge of just science and, and technical approaches. What I like to look for are a few keywords that fall outside of that traditional set, um, things like information theory or sigma processing. Um, even optimization, I think, falls outside of the traditional set. So it's good to look for a little bit of variety there. Then if we move forward. You know, one thing I, I'd love to, to add in, in, into this, uh, Andrea, excuse me. Um, let me just jump in here. Um, you know, Git, GitHub is something that's kind of new to the analytics uh, profession. Um, but I'm really starting to encourage my candidates to make sure that they start to beef up the content on their GitHub because that's something that I think um, you really it, it goes so far beyond just keywords because it really does demonstrate what you know um, as opposed to what you can put on a resume. So yeah, I'm glad you brought um, that up. Some people, before they even do a code test or bring someone in, will glance through their GitHub repo. Yep. Absolutely. And it's Absolutely. There. It, it's uh, it's almost um, expected now. Uh, so you know, the, my candidates need to sort of understand that and and come up to speed pretty quickly on it. Certainly, the the more junior level people. Yeah. Yeah. That said, it's not. Um, for people hiring, it's not an absolute requirement. Um, there are people who are very strong mathematically, who have a coding background, but may not have a public-facing um, hobby GitHub repo. So it's 
So it's something to look for, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily a requirement um, as a hiring person. So then, once you actually bring a person in for an interview or go through a calling process with them, there's the kinds of questions that you want to ask them. You want to ask them questions more along the lines of how would you do something rather than what is the definition of blank. Um, you want that, them to describe the hardest problem they've solved. Um, you'll really see if they've solved a problem that didn't have a well-defined answer before. Um, this is really important if someone doesn't have a lot of visible experience on their resume. If there's someone who's been through more of a boot camp or an online course, they might be used to solving problems that have well-defined answers, things like homeworks or projects, data sets that have been already cleaned for them. Um, but if they discuss problems where there wasn't a well-defined outcome or they actually defined the problem in themselves or came up with the project themselves, that tells you that they're able to think through the entire process and have taken something difficult to completion. So that's definitely something to look for. Um, and as we were discussing in the previous slide, you, you want to ask for several work samples. One of those can be GitHub repos. One of those could be blog posts for projects, or they can just discuss work that they've done in the past. Um, a few other things to look for in the interview are really the data scientist's ingenuity. Um, are they able to come up with creative answers? Are they able to decompose a problem and think about the individual pieces? So you ask questions that have answers that will take several minutes to discuss. Um, you can use the same set of questions for every person that you're talking to, but make sure that you go from a straightforward, let's say you're assessing machine learning, you can start with a simple machine learning question and then start adding factors. Oh, what if there's more variables? What if, I, what if the data is noisy? What if there's missing data? Um, what do you do if you, the data grows by 1,000? data points or a million data points. Start asking more complicated things um, about the particular problem. This is also a great place to assess uh, skepticism. Again, if you have the candidate go through a code test or a coding problem, you can give them data that has pitfalls in it, mistakes that people make. So one thing that people might make a mistake on in real life is they'll find predictability where there is none. So one thing we've done in the past is give people a data set where there is no relationship between the different factors and ask them to build a machine learning system based on that. Someone with kind of a, a Kaggle or a very beginning machine learning background will go ahead and to go through all of the machine learning steps. They'll build a classifier or a regression system. They'll do regularization, they'll do cross-validation, all the steps. And then when they're showing the final result, since it's noise data, data that doesn't really predict, it'll be behaving at chance. It'll be, be behaving about as well as flipping a coin. And then you can ask, what do you think? Would you recommend this to your boss or to your organization? And if someone who looks at a machine learning model behaving at chance says, this looks pretty good to me, I did all the steps, you know they haven't gone through that kind of critical thinking step. So really making sure you, you give them problems um, that address the common pitfalls. Great. Thank this you, Andrea. This is really great, Andrea. I just have to jump in here and say that um, it's so important now to really drill down and assess skills um, more than ever, because we all know, you know, everybody thinks of themselves now as a data scientist. So, um, and it's easy to put keywords on a resume, um, but it's it's much much harder to, uh, you know, put the rigor behind that. You know, statistics, mathematics, operations, research, all you know, these technical disciplines are 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 not trivial. They're tough. It takes years of training and learning, and um, um, and and you know, sometimes you know, I think that there's this perception out here that you know, all I need to do is you know, be able to read about this and I can put it on my resume. And that's just not true. It's just not true. 
Great. So I also want to talk a little bit about some of the soft skills. Um, people are very familiar, maybe, maybe not, but I'm imagining that most of the audience has seen some version of this Venn diagram on the left that talks about data science as the intersection of engineering, domain knowledge, statistics. I think there's various versions of this Venn diagram that really speak to the data science the data scientists work day to day. Um, and while I think that, that this Venn diagram is true, I, I found that it doesn't tell the whole story. And I think it's because data scientists are not just sitting at their computers doing this work day to day. They exist inside of real organizations, whether small or large. It's important that data scientists can work productively to drive business results. And so there's some key skills that we've found are essential for data scientists to be successful in a real world environment. The first of this is communication. Um, it is essential to have a data scientist that knows how to communicate with different parts of the organization. And when I say different parts, it's everything from engineering to business uh, leaders to analysts. Across the organization, a, data, a great data scientist should know how to be able to explain the concepts that they're talking about in terms that somebody else on the other side of the room can understand. They're going to need to be able to go to engineering and talk about the importance of their algorithm and why it needs to be run and how, and how to be able to get that into production. They're going to need to be able to go to business leaders and explain the business implications of the results and how they came to that. And so when you're interviewing somebody, it's really important to not say, okay, this person has a really strong technical background. It's okay that maybe they can't explain this as well, as this concept as well as I would like, because what you're going to find is that person is not going to be successful three to six months down the line because they're not going to be able to push the results that the organization needs. Second piece is follow through. Um, and, and this really goes with the same notion of persistence. So data science is hard. Um, Andrea is, I would say, being humble in how she talks about this. Um, <laughs> data science is, is I would agree. really, these are research problems that require people with strong technical backgrounds and really strong work ethics because there's oftentimes un large unknown unknowns of the data science problem. There's high levels of variance in terms of getting results and what it takes to get there. And so you really need to be able to trust that somebody has a hunger and a thirst to get to an answer and, and really won't quit. Because oftentimes, yes, you can get a result early on, but if you actually peel it back, the result won't hold up to a high level of scrutiny. And, and the whole point of data science is finding real truth in a lot of information. And so if you're just getting fake information, your data science effort is wasted. The other piece I, I would really emphasize is carefulness um, and detail orientation. So in a real world environment, you're not going to be able to go into all of some a data scientist work. And it's not always going to be tested out um, in terms of some of the insights you might get in a way that you can verify 100%. So you need to have 100% trust that a data scientist is uh, crossing their T's, dotting their I's, because data is messy, data is complex. And if somebody makes a mistake in a, in a SQL query early on in their process, it can throw off results way down the line. And when a data scientist is working on a project, you want to be able to give them that leeway to be in their own space for a month, two months, so that they can really drive home a problem. You need to be able to trust that they are taking every effort to be careful so that when they come out on the other side, the answer is strong and robust. So Andrew did a, did a great job of talking through some of the technical skills. And, and I just want to touch on some of the soft skills and how to, how to assess for those. Um, and I think it's a lot of the same story, but making sure that you do touch on this. And what I would say is for the HR professionals in the room, um, I think that what I see a lot of times is recru recruiters and HR professionals who take an engineering playbook to recruiting data scientists. And what I would say is, is that I think there's a stronger role um, for the way HR and recruiting can work to hire data scientists, because data scientists are so cross-functional in our organization, assessing for these soft skills is not just a nice to have. It's really the difference between somebody who can come in and do a little bit of work versus somebody who can be transformative for an organization. 
So I, I would really emphasize asking a lot of the same questions that, that you might ask on a technical side. So how would you go about solving a problem? And if you are a business, a business person, a non-technical person, hearing about how they would talk about that and how they would choose the tools is just as important if you're a technical, per technical person interviewing as if you're a non-technical person because you'll be able to assess their critical thinking and you can be able to ask them a lot of why questions. But well, why would you choose that tool? Why are you choosing that database? Explain to me that database. And if you can peel back that thinking, you can get to a point where either they are just throwing out technical terms or they can explain to a non-technical person why they're making the decision. I also think, as Andrew touched on, look for real prior work experience. And, and I would really emphasize on a focus on results. So a lot of data scientists, um, bless them, are, are very interested in a lot of the tools. And, and, it, and it's because they have a passion for data, they have a passion for technology. And those are people that you want. You want people that are passionate. But you also want to make sure you have people that can get to the real results at the end of the day for a business. So it's less interesting when I hear from a data scientist, hey, I built a recommendation engine uh, that we productionized to you know, over a million users. What I actually want to hear is I decreased acquisition costs at my company 5%. Because what that shows is that the data scientist is focused on actually getting to a business outcome that moves the needle. Another key thing that, that we've always asked data scientists and we highly recommend is explaining two to three statistical concepts to a non-technical audience. And the value of this is, is twofold. One is it assesses their communication skills and their ability to talk through something technical to a non-technical audience. But two, it also assesses their critical thinking. So w what we like to say is that you know, a lot of data science and a lot of statistics is just you know, mathematical formulation of common sense. And, and a good data scientist should be able to take a statistical idea and explain it in layman's terms. So I'll ask you know, to someone who's maybe a little more junior, just what is the difference between logistic regression and linear regression? Um, and I just want to—I just want to hear. Hey, logistic regression is, is a classification method, and linear regression is a regression method. Um, you know, if I want to hear, I might ask them about a distance measure: cosine similarity versus Euclidean distance. Tell me about why you'd use one versus another, and what this gives me is a sense for: Hey, can they take the, the intuition behind these ideas and actually understand why you would apply them, rather than just blindly pulling up a um, Python package and throwing, throwing statistical um, techniques at, at a problem. And I'll just jump in really quickly to say, um, in many of the interviews that I've done, this question has been a bit of a, a make or break question because it'll also show you their character in discussing uh, technical concepts to non-technical people. If they get frustrated or say, well, you know, that's not something I have to do, all of a sudden you see how they would interact with, with the non-technical people. Right. And, and I would say that you can parlay that into this next point, which is have them solve a sample business problem. So don't shy away from saying, hey, listen, our company wants to increase revenue X percent is here. This is the data we have. How would you go about it? Because that is the real world. Uh, a good data scientist, as Andrew really nailed, nailed home, is able to understand a problem and able to gather the right data for that problem. So they should be able to go all the way from, hey, what are your business results that you need, and what is the data I have, to how can I put together that problem? So while they may not know, hey, this is specifically each point that I would, I would, I would do to get to an answer, they should be able to carve out, hey, this is the data I need, this is how I would think about the problem, and these would be my steps to getting to completion. And somebody who's gone through that process a few times knows where the danger zones are, knows where the gotchas are, as well as knows what's going to move the needle at the end of the day. And what's so important about that is, again, data science problems are oftentimes research problems that we don't know what the outcome is or what they're going to take. So somebody who has a sense for the, the landmines in a problem is something that you're going to be able to trust uh, to actually get to results at the end of the day. And then finally, uh, I think this is easy to forget, but 
really important to understand why they like data science. Um, it's no secret that data scientists are paid well right now. It's a trending title. Um, a lot of people want to be in data science. It's hip. Um, and so you really want to ask them why. Um, what you want to look for, at least in our experience, is people that just get excited about data. If they have a data set in front of them, you really can't stop them from wanting to look at it, finding truth in it. Um, because those are the people that when they hear, hey, we have all this data, they're going to be like, what can I do with this data? How can I drive business results? What's, what is the information in this? And they will be working hard to deliver on results that you will, won't even be able to imagine. And they will push a data science program to be transformative for your organization. That's, that's a great point, Jonathan. I think that one thing that I um, hear so often is, um, you know, do they have a passion? Um, because that math is really, really important. You know, what are they doing outside of the formal work, uh, work setting that would demonstrate that they have more than just a passing interest or a career interest in, uh, in working with data or coding or analytics? Um, you know, if they're spending time um, on their, you know, weekends or evenings, um, uh, working on a passion project, let's say, or, um, you know, just playing around with something on Kaggle, you know, those are all really good uh, signs that that person is, uh, you know, passionate about what, what, uh, what they're doing in data science. So just a, a word of caution. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, it's a trending profession, and, and I should say that, that this might be a little harsh on the business analysts, statisticians, DBAs, and full-stack programmers. I have seen some successful data scientists with all those backgrounds. I just would highly encourage you know, really digging into someone's resume and looking at it thoroughly, as, as Andrew described, because it's very easy for somebody who's been a DBA for 15 years to uh, transform their resume into a data science resume and get through a light screening process. That said, I do think if you can focus, if you focus on the soft skills, you focus on the critical thinking, um, you can find people from these backgrounds if, if, that have some statistical knowledge um, as well as that drive. You can find great people. So finally, it's not just enough to uh, know who to hire, but actually hiring and retaining them. Um, so some key, key things that we've found actually allow an organization to have a successful data science program. So uh, first of all, data scientists are expensive, um, and it's not just the data scientists themselves. In order to have a successful data science program, um, you should be budgeting to spend about 50-50 on, on payroll as well as tools, technology, and engineering, because it's not just enough to get the data scientist into a seat. You need to give them the tools uh, to actually be able to push their work into the organization. Second of all, culture of learning and research. A lot of great data scientists come from academia where they want to be able to solve problems. And so giving them the space that feels comfortable to them to be able to solve problems how they've historically solved problems is very important. You want to be able to give them access to journals. You want to give them access to the ability to publish. That way, they're able to advance their career um, as well as be around others who have that same passion for research. And the final one is, is good data and good problems. Um, a lot of data scientists are going to see job postings for data scientists, and the first question is going to be, is this a business analyst role? Is this a data engineering role? What you want to be able to tell them is we have data, we have real problems, this is the problem we want you to solve, first thing, and we're going to make it so that you can actually focus on that problem. And, and I would emphasize this because I think there's, this is a way that you know, maybe organizations that are not in Silicon Valley or might have huge global campuses and not appear as sexy as the latest uh, unicorn coming out of San Francisco can really attract data scientists. And it's because they have historical data, they have lots of data, and that's a real sell to strong data science candidates. I would say as long as they can ensure for that data scientist that they're gonna make that data accessible, that's a real draw. That's a good point. I, I, um, one of the things that I wanted to add to this slide is um, uh, we recently conducted a survey of um, our contacts for 
uh, a piece that's going into uh, CIO magazine. And um, these flash surveys we send out um, have one question, and we wanted to know what is your primary reason for wanting to change jobs. Now, the one number one reason uh, is, as everybody could probably guess, is they're doing it for money, or that's their number one motivating factor. But besides money, um, the number one was that data science was not valued in the organization and followed closely by company culture. So those are the two things that I think um, um, you know, everybody really needs to focus on um, and deliver that message in a real positive way to anybody that you're that you're trying to recruit. Yeah, I, I would say that's a hundred percent true from from what we've seen as well. So just a, a quick note, um, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to Katie to finish things up. Um, we love talking about this. Um, if you want to reach out just to talk about data, talk about building a successful data science program, um, obviously um, we've invested a lot in creating a data science platform so that once you've hired um, the data scientists, they're actually able to have the results for your organization and able to work successfully. Um, so always happy to talk about our platform and how that's transforming organizations. Or again, if you just want some help or you want to talk to somebody else who's, who's been in the trenches, feel free to reach out to myself or Andrea. So I will turn it back over to Katie to finish things up and take questions. Perfect. Thanks, Jonathan um, and Andrea. That was all really great information. Um, we are just about to go into Q&A, so if anyone has additional questions that you want um, our speakers to answer for you, feel free to submit those to me through the chat box and we'll get to them in just a minute. Um, as for Birchworks, we have a few upcoming webinar events that you will want to kind of keep an eye out for. Um, first is the 2017 release of our updated Birchworks study for predictive analytics professionals, which will have updated salaries, demographic information, and hiring market insights. Um, the reports are always highly anticipated, so keep your eyes on your inbox for an invite to the webinar uh, in the upcoming weeks here. And then in October, we'll be launching a new series with career coach Tim Russmeyer, whose experience as an analytics executive has made him an invaluable resource to many quantitative professionals looking to assess their careers, and whom we are excited to be launching a new partnership with. So keep an eye out for his content coming soon to our blog and our webinar series. Um, if you are looking to stay in touch with us, you can follow Birchworks and DataScience.com on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, um, and on Twitter, that's at Birchworks and at Data Science Inc. Well, I think we're about ready for the questions portion of the presentation, so let's kind of jump right in here. Um, like I said, feel free to continue sending your questions in using the chat box on your screen, um, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. So let's kind of jump in with the first question um, for our speakers. Um, we actually had a couple of questions about this. Um, so let's start with this one. Um, could you comment on your impression of boot camps um, and the quality of job-ready candidates that they are creating for the market, um, and how does that kind of stack up against traditional sort of formal master's program candidates? Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and tackle this one. Um, I think boot camps are very high variance in terms of, I think they're doing a great job in terms of introducing people to machine learning concepts, but I think there's high variance in the, the people that come out in terms of being independent data scientists. Um, and the way that I assess people who have a boot camp background is I look at their experience prior to the boot camp. If they have a mathematical or a science background um, before the boot camp, and they use the boot camp kind of to refresh their skills, to plug any holes or gaps, um, to make sure that they learned about some additional things like data engineering that they might not have learned when they were doing more science or academic work, those people tend to have amazing outcomes, um, and they're very effective data scientists. If it's someone who doesn't have a technical background, they don't have a base in math or a base in science, I'm not sure if a boot camp is enough for someone to be an independent data scientist, but if you're looking for someone who's more of an analyst or someone who can fit into a team where you can introduce them to concepts, teach them the way that you do things, do a lot of mentoring, 
Um, those candidates, I think, fit better into that kind of slot. Perfect. Thank you, Andrea. Um, another sort of question about, um, you guys were just talking about looking for people who are passionate about data science. Um, someone asked, isn't hiring a passionate individual kind of a double-edged sword? Because for most businesses, the versatility of problems is pretty thin. Wouldn't these individuals just get bored and leave? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I saw this one actually. It's a it's a funny question. Um, I guess my first answer is I don't think I'd want to hire an impassionate person for any job. Um, but that's my short answer. Um, <laughs> but my longer answer is um, in in my role here at Data Science, I've actually seen how the the problems that a lot of different businesses have, um, the data science problems that they have, or the the data problems that they have. And I don't think I've ever seen a business that has data that had boring data um, or boring problems. So I, I I would say I don't think that that would really be a concern. I think maybe, um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly where the, the, the person was going with the question, but I'm wondering yeah. if um, they might be talking about spending so much time working with the data as opposed mm -hmm. to actually getting involved in developing the analytics around solving a problem. And a lot of times we'll hear that where, they're, uh, where they maybe were hired ahead of the curve a little bit um, and the data is not quite ready, so they spend all their time uh, working on that kind of thing. Yeah, I will say data cleaning is not fun. Um, that is something, and I mean, I think that's something that someone more on the data engineering, data science side right. Um, right. could do more work on, but... Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll jump in here. I mean, what, what are you passionate about? Um, you know, everyone's probably passionate about something, um, whether it's related to their work or not. and so. If they're passionate about driving business results and using their business skills to do that, then you're not going to have any problems. As Andrew said, data is interesting for data scientists and data problems are interesting. And if they've gone through one data set and, and had success with that, then they're going to get the company to invest in getting more data and they're going to really transform an organization. Yeah. So if somebody who's passionate about using using the latest you know, data pipeline technology, I mean, that's that's not going to be passion, that's going to be helpful for your organization because that's what they're going to be focused on. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really just what kind of passion do they have. Yeah. And if you don't have data, then maybe you don't need a data scientist, right? Right. Kind of true. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you all for all of those insights. Um, we got another actually really interesting question um, from someone who is hiring, mentioning that they can find people who pass all of the technical skill tests and interviews and they seem to have passion, but when they get there, um, they want to follow instructions. So basically they want someone to give them all the steps of what needs to be done. Um, do you have any sort of tried and true tips on how to assess for order takers versus initiators? Yeah. Um so, uh, you, if you can speak to this, John. Yeah. So, so to me, I guess I'll just talk about my my own opinion on this, which is, I think this is for any role important. Um, I think something you should know about us is when we hire for people, we look for people that have pushed the needle, um, created something out of nothing, or gone over and above. We really look for that quality. And I think it that quality is applicable in any role at any level. So honestly. I asked what they've done in their life. I've asked when have they done something that, that went over and above. And if it was, you know, hey, I did a good job on some project at work, that's not something that's going to push the needle. If it's someone who said, hey, when I was in college, I created a data science program for my university that didn't have one, that's somebody who is going to make things happen. If it's someone who said, hey, I created this whole open source package, maybe it's not the most famous open source package, but it has some followers, that's somebody who's making things happen. And so I personally don't think it's um, 
specific to data science. I think it's just really about assessing people that want to make things happen or, and are highly proactive in what they've done in their life. Yeah, uh, for people who have come from academia, I look for um, journal publications. Journal publications require at least a year of, of effort, um, and they're very much a, a sign of someone being able to, to make it through quite a lot of, of difficulty and quite a lot of iterations. Um, so that's someone who can take something to completion. Um, but really, you can just ask, like, what ideas were yours and how did you come up with them? You can just ask. Just make sure that you Thank ask you. for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, question more kind of from the uh, overall sort of company side. Um, how kind of the data science profession addresses corporate culture. So what are the major obstacles you've seen in companies in order that kind of block them from integrating a data-driven approach? Yeah, so the, the number one thing is, is an organization that emphasizes silos and fragmentation. So for data scientists to be successful, they really need to be able to have access across the organization and for people to understand that Data science is a organizational initiative. It's not just enough to hire data scientists and put them on the sidelines. Everyone at the company needs to know, hey, we're taking data seriously. We're using data to help our, drive our decision making in, in a way that's gonna be a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit new, but something that has to happen. Uh, that will give the, the data scientists license to be able to work across stakeholders as well as pull the data together, because for a lot of organizations, they're probably they're sitting on fragmented data, they're sitting on people who have short-term goals, and everybody needs to know that hiring a data scientist is about becoming a data-driven company, and, and everyone has a role to play in supporting that individual. And you need an executive or a leadership champion that will push data science within the organization. People don't like to change the way that they do things. So even if a data scientist comes up with an algorithm, a technique, a recommendation engine that makes your work better, faster, cheaper by half or 50%, people may not use it just because they want to do things the way they've always done. So you need someone in leadership that says, try their prototype, give them feedback, see how it does, do you like it, if not why, just pushing that change. Yeah, absolutely, Andrea, I think that's a great point. I um, the, the ability to evangelize the use of uh, data-driven decision-making through the organization is really important. You need to have that champion at the top, but when you're evaluating candidates, you have to uh, uh, make sure that you um, have confidence that they're going to be, even at a junior level, an evangelist for the, the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. We received a couple questions about the best ways to assess technical skills that I wanted to ask you guys. Um, one person wrote in that they found that some that work samples and GitHub projects aren't always available because the work is proprietary to the company the person was working for. Um, what do you think about take-home projects as an alternative? Um, and then another question was, do you guys have any recommendations about um, like third parties that provide good coding tests? that would be relevant for data scientists? I don't have answers on the coding test one, um, but I can answer the first about GitHub and work samples. Um, we have used take home projects. Um, I think we've seen good results with them, um, especially if you step through them with them and ask them why they made particular decisions. That's a great place to um, inject a few pitfalls you know that happen in uh, data science work, things like noisy data or mm -hmm. things that are non-predictive of other things. Um, I think just make sure that they are doable and give people the time to give them the attention that they need. Yeah, I would just emphasize know what you want to get out of them. I mean, yeah. they're, not a silver, they're not a silver bullet. Um, so hey, if you want to just test for detail-orientedness and test for 
um, you know, basic comprehension, they can be really successful. If you want to test for critical thinking, they can be successful. What they can't test for is everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, data scientists are notorious for being, you know, very smart, maybe quirky sometimes. Um, so how important is the ability for them to be able to work in a team environment, and how would you assess that during the interview process? I'll let you, yeah, I'll so let you go I, first. Yeah, I would say 100% uh, important they can work in a team environment. And a hundred percent that being quirky and being able to work in a team environment are, are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, sometimes it's a double negative. You can be quirky and working in a team environment. Um, I think that that's a larger organizational thing. And I, yes, if you are a buttoned up organization bringing in data scientists who may come from more research backgrounds, yeah, they're gonna, they're probably going to be a little bit different. But in an organization that wants to be successful as data science and wants to be successful as a whole. Everyone, everyone should be on the same page. And that, that's a question for how do you bring together teams of different backgrounds? And I think that's really about making sure everyone understands each other. And it's not just about making sure that the people traditionally on the team understand the data scientists and their role, but really making sure that the data scientist understands other people's roles and, and understands how they think about it. Because I will say, uh, not to, I, I speak very highly of PhDs, but I think they also come from a background that is very different from business. And I think they've come from a world of research and, and hard questions and business can move fast, oftentimes with low information, and they're very different. And so making sure a data scientist understands uh, the work that everyone else on the team does and, and how they work through problems is, is going to be as critical as the reverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I'll say that well, first, just to speak to uh, John's PhD point. Um, so that's that's my background, um, and some people that shift, some people that shift from PhDs to industry is because they want to work on those fast, applied, impactful work. Um, but to speak more about uh, teamwork and uh, I don't know quirkiness, I guess. Um, I think it's absolutely critical that data scientists can work with your team and that they can communicate well. Um, they're not going to come into your organization knowing what what is important to your organization and what, what's the domain knowledge that your organization has built over years of experience. And those things are absolutely essential to their projects. They need to know what metrics matter, how do they push the needle, how do their end users behave? What do they like? What do they need? They need to be talking to everyone and understand everyone. So I would say teamwork is, is one of the essential points. Perfect. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to answer those questions. Um, we're about out of time here. So as a quick reminder, this uh, today's session was recorded and our video will be available on the Birchworks YouTube channel within a couple of days. So if you want to share this with colleagues, be on the lookout for it there. Um, but thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and everyone have a great day.